Chapter Seventeen of Bindle by Herbert Jenkins. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Don W. Jenkins. Chapter Seventeen. Bindle makes a mistake. One. Bindle there? No, sir. He's down the yard. Tell him I want him. Right, sir. The manager of the West London Furniture Depository Limited returned to his office. A few minutes later Bindle knocked at the door and, removing the blue and white cricket cap from his head, entered in response to the manager's, Come in. Wonder what he's found out. Shouldn't be surprised if it was them guns, muttered Bindle prophetically under his breath bindle had been employed by the depository for six months and had acquitted himself well he was a good workman and trustworthy and had given conclusive proof that he knew his business the manager looked up from a letter he held in his hand i've had a very serious letter from sir charles Custance of little compton he began no bad news i hope sir remarked bindle cheerfully brooks sort of shook him up a bit according to his own account brooks was the foreman pantechnicon man the manager frowned and proceeded to read aloud sir charles's letter it recapitulated the events that had taken place at little compton painting bindle and the foreman as a pair of the most desperate cutthroats conceivable threatening not only them but the west london furniture depository with every imaginable pain and penalty when he had finished the manager looked up at bindle with great severity you've heard what sir charles custance writes what have you got to say he asked bindle scratched his head and shuffled his feet then he looked up with a grin yer say sir i wasn't to know that they was as scared as rabbits o the germans i just sort o let an int drop all innocent like and the old bloomin place turns itself into a sort o scotland yard but you sought out sir charles and the manager referred to the letter and laid before me an information he says i didn't say nothink before him sir not even a complaint although is language when he come out of the ark wasn't fit for ginger to ear and gingers ain't exactly sunday school talk the manager was short-handed and anxious to find some means of placating so important a man as sir charles custance and at the same time retaining bindle's services he bit the top of his pen meditatively it was bindle who solved the problem i better resign he suggested and then join up again later sir you can write and say i'm under notice to go the manager pondered a while he was responsible for the conduct of the affairs of the depository and after all sir charles custance and the others had been mainly responsible for what had occurred i'll think the matter over he remarked in the meantime brooks is away mr coulter is ill and jameson hasn't turned up this morning and we have that move in west kensington to get through during the day do you think that you can be responsible for it sure of it sir i been in the profession man and boy all me life the west london furniture depository made a specialty of moving clients furniture whilst they were holiday making they undertook to set out the rooms in the new house exactly as they had been in the old with due allowance for changed geography there is the specification said the manager handing bindle a paper now how will you set to work five bed two reception one study one kitchen one nursery read bindle two bands'll do it sir best bedroom servants dining room number one second bedroom drawing room number two two bedrooms and kitchen number three and the rest number four then you see we shan't get em mixed the manager nodded approvingly do you think you could replace the furniture sure as i am a mrs bindle i can carry an old ouse in me eye they won't know they've even moved the keys are at the west kensington police station here is the authority with a note from me it's number one eighty one Branksom road you're to fetch the furniture from here's the key of the house you are to take it to number thirty three lebanon avenue chiswick take numbers six and eight vans with wilkes huggles randers and the new man right sir said bindle i'll see it through bindle returned to the yard where he narrated to his mates what had just taken place in the manager's room so yer see ginger i'm still going to stay with yer correct yer language and make a gentleman o yer so cheer up appy 
Bindle gathered together his forces and set out. He was glad to be able to include Ginger, whose misanthropic outlook upon life was a source of intense interest to him. Outside the police station he stepped off the tailboard of the front van, saying that he would overtake them. "'Come to give yourself up?' inquired the sergeant, who had a slight acquaintance with Bindle. "'Not yet, old sport. Going to give yer a chance to earn promotion. I come for a key.' Bindle handed in his credentials. At that moment two constables entered with a drunken woman screaming obscenities. The men had all they could do with her. Bindle listened for a moment. "'Lord, she ain't learnt all that at Sunday school,' he muttered, then turned to the sergeant and said, "'Ere, give me my key. I did not to ear such things.' The sergeant hurriedly turned to a rack behind him, picked up the key, and handed it to Bindle. His attention was engrossed with the new case. It meant a troublesome day for him. Bindle signed for the key, put it in his pocket, and left the station. He overtook the vans just as they were entering Brangsome Road. Pulling the key out of his pocket, he looked at the tag. Funny, he muttered. Thought he said a hundred and eighty-one, not a hundred and thirty-one. He took a scrap of paper out of his pocket on which he had written down the number in the manager's office. It was clearly 181. The sergeant had given him the wrong key. "'Ere I!' he began, when he stopped suddenly, a grin overspreading his features. Suddenly he slapped his knee. "'What a go! Holy Moses! I'll do it! I only hope they haven't left no servants in the house. Won't it be? Hi! Where the hell are you going to? You're passing the house!' "'Didn't yer say a hundred and eighty one came the hoarse voice of Wilkes from the front of the first of the Pantechnicons. "'A hundred and thirty-one, you old duggins. Hadn't yer better count it up on your fingers? Yer can use your toes, if you like.' There was a growl in response. Bindle was popular with his mates, and no one ever took offence at what he said. The two vans drew up before number 131, and the four men grouped themselves by the gate. Bindle surveyed them with a grin. "'Lord, what a army of old reprobates! Wilkes!' said Bindle gravely, addressing an elderly man with a stubbly beard and a persistent cough of which he made the most. "'Yer must get out of that habit of yours a shaving only on jubilee days and golden weddings. It spoils your appearance. Yer don't get no more kisses than a curry-comb.' Bindle was in high spirits. Hello, Ginger. Where's that clean collar you was wearin' last Tuesday week? Lent it to the lodger? Here, you come along. Let's lay the dust fore we starts. And Bindle and his squad trooped off to the nearest public house. A quarter of an hour later they returned and set to work. Bindle laboured like one possessed and inspired his men to more than usual efforts. Nothing had been prepared, and consequently there was much more to do than was usually the case one of the men remarked upon this fact they ain't a-goin to pay yer for doin things and do em theirselves so look slippy was bindle's response the people at number one twenty nine manifested considerable surprise in the doings of bindle and his assistants soon after a start had been made the maid-servant came to the front door for a few moments and watched the operations with keen interest as bindle staggered down the path beneath a particularly voluminous armchair she ventured a tentative remark i'm surprised that mrs rogers is movin she said not half as surprised as she'll be when she finds out muttered bindle with a grin as he deposited the chair on the tail of the van for ginger to stow away funny she shouldn't have told yer he remarked to the girl as he returned up the path you ain't half as funny as you think retorted the girl with a toss of her head if you're as funny as you look ruthie dear you ought to be worth a lot to your family retorted bindle where did you get that nose from snapped the girl pertly same place as you got that face only i got there first now run in ruthie there's a good girl i'm busy i'm also married the girl retired discomfited later in the day the mistress of number one twenty nine emerged on her way to pay a call seeing bindle she paused lifted her lorgnettes and surveyed him with cold insolence is mrs rogers moving she asked no mum replied bindle we're going to take the furniture for a ride in the park you're an extremely impertinent fellow was the retort i shall report you to your employers please don't do that mum think of me hungry wives and child 
there was no further endeavour to inquire of the destination of mrs rogers possessions by four o'clock the last load had left a miscellaneous mass of oddments that puzzled bindle how he was ever going to sort them out it was past seven before bindle and his men had finished their work the miscellaneous things obviously the accumulation of many years had presented problems but bindle had overcome them by putting in the coal cellar everything that he could not crowd in a lumber room at the top of the house or distribute through the rest of the rooms seemed to have moved in a hurry coughed wilkes i never see such a lot of truck in all me life perhaps they owed the rent suggested uggles 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 remonstrated bindle with a grin i'm surprised at you cause your family has shot the moon for years uggles i'm pained bindle duly returned the key to the police station put up the vans and himself saw that the horses were made comfortable for the night whenever in charge of a job he always made this his own particular duty two at six o'clock on the following afternoon a railway omnibus drew up at the west kensington police station in it were mr and mrs railton rogers seven little rogerses a nursemaid and what is known in suburbia as a cook general after some difficulty mr rogers a bald-headed thick-set man with the fussy deportment of a thames tug extricated himself from his progeny after repeated injunctions to it to remain quiet he disappeared into the police station and a few minutes later emerged with the key don't do that eustace he called out eustace was doing nothing but press a particularly stubby nose against the window of the omnibus but mr rogers was a man who must talk if only to keep himself in practice if nothing worthy of comment presented itself he would exclaim apropos the slightest sound or movement what's that the omnibus started off again and a few minutes later turned into brangsome road it was nelly the second girl aged eleven who made the startling discovery mother mother look at our house it's empty she cried excitedly nelly be quiet commanded mr rogers from sheer habit but father father look look she persisted pointing in the direction of number one thirty one mr rogers looked and looked again he then looked at his family as if to assure himself of his own identity good god emily he gasped emily was mrs rogers look emily looked she was a heavy apathetic woman who seemed always to be a day in arrears of the amount of sleep necessary to her a facetious relative had dubbed her the sleeping partner from the house mrs rogers looked back to her husband as if seeking her cue from him i've stolen my horse a howl of protest arose from eustace and for once he went uncorrected the omnibus drew up with a groan and a squeak opposite number one thirty one mr rogers followed by a stream of the rogerses bounded out and up the path like a comet that had outstripped its tail he opened the door with almost incredible quickness entered and rushed in and out of the rooms like a lost dog seeking his master he then darted up the stairs the seven little rogerses streaming after him when he had reached the top floor and had thoroughly assured himself that everywhere there was a void of desolation he uttered a howl of despair and forgetful of the tale of young rogerses toiling after him in vain turned and tearing down the stairs collided with nelly who losing her balance fell back on eustace who in turn lost his balance and amidst wails and yells comet and tail tumbled down the stairs and lay in a heap on the first floor landing mr rogers was the first to disentangle himself from the struggling mass stop it you little beast stop it he shouted they stopped it gazing in wonderment at their father as he once more dashed down the stairs at the door mr rogers found mrs rogers and the two maids talking to the next-door neighbour mrs clark who was there with her maid whom bindle had addressed as ruthie as he approached mrs clark was saying i thought there must be something wrong the man looked such a desperate fellow and why didn't you inform the police snapped mr rogers it was not my business mr rogers replied mrs clark with dignity then turning to mrs rogers and the maid she added the way that man spoke to my maid was a scandal and he was most insolent to me also get in you little devils get in mr rogers roared albert dear don't expostulated mrs rogers with unaccustomed temerity in you get he repeated and the family and maids were packed once more into the omnibus 
"'Back to the police station!' shouted Mr. Rogers. Just as the vehicle was on the move, Mrs. Clark came down to the gate and called out, "'I told Archie to follow the van on his bicycle in case anything was wrong. He's got the address, but I have forgotten it. He will be back in a minute. It was somewhere in Chiswick.' "'Send him round to the police station!' shouted Mr. Rogers. "'For God's sake, hurry! This is not a funeral!' he almost shrieked to the driver. "'No, and I ain't no bloomin' nigger either,' growled the man. Neighbors were all at their gates, scenting trouble in the way that neighbors will. All sorts of rumors were afloat, the prevalent idea being that Mr. Rogers was a bankrupt and that his furniture had been taken by the representatives of his creditors. At the police station, Mr. Rogers once more bounced from the omnibus, the little Rogerses climbing out after him. This time the nursemaid joined the crowd in the charge-room. "'I've been robbed!' almost sobbed Mr. Rogers, then with unconscious irony added, "'Everything is gone except my wife and children.' The sergeant was conventionally sympathetic, but officially reticent. A man should be sent to number 31 Branksome Road to institute inquiries." what the devil is the use of that shouted mr rogers i want my furniture and it's not in my house what are the police for i want my horse used to set up another howl he together with his six brothers and sisters and the nursemaid were now ranged behind their father looking with large-eyed wonder at the sergeant look at these mr rogers turned and with a sweep of his hand indicated the progeny as if he were a barrister calling attention to a row of exhibits what am i to do with them to-night there was another howl from Eustace, and a whimper from Muriel, the youngest. The sergeant had not been on duty when Bindle called for the key, but he had heard it said that the key of number 131 had been handed to the bearer of a letter from a firm of furniture removers. This he explained to Mr. Rogers, regretting that apparently the letter itself had been put aside. On Monday the whole matter should be threshed out, and the guilty brought to justice. He gave the assurance rather as an official formality than as the result of any inherent conviction of his own. "'Monday!' almost shrieked Mr. Rogers. "'What am I to do until Monday?' The sergeant suggested that perhaps the neighbors might extend hospitality. "'Who is going to take in eleven people?' shouted Mr. Rogers. "'We shall all starve!' At this announcement the Rogerses, who were all sturdy trenchermen, set up such a howl as to bring mrs rogers and the other maid out of the omnibus just at that moment archie clark a precocious youth of twelve rode up full of importance and information he pushed his way through the mass of rogerses and without preliminary shouted thirty-three lebanon avenue chiswick that's where the van went the sergeant picked up a pen and began to take down the address get into the bus get in all of you shouted mr rogers he saw that little help was to be obtained from the police in the hurry of getting off somehow or other and in spite of his protests archie clark was bundled into the omnibus and eustace was left howling on the pavement beside archie's bicycle three bindle had discovered at the office that the new occupants of thirty three lebanon avenue expected to reach chiswick about six o'clock on the day following the move it was nearly a quarter to seven before their taxi hove in sight. Bindle sauntered up the avenue whistling and arrived just in time to see Mr. Daniel Granger open the front door with a key, enter, and suddenly bolt out very hurriedly and examine the number. Then he looked in again and called to Mrs. Granger, a thin little woman with round black eyes and a porcelain smile that deceived no one. Mrs. Granger tripped up the path and followed the burly form of her husband through the door by this time bindle had reached the gate want a hand with the luggage mate he inquired of the taxi driver maybe yes maybe no was the reply bindle examined the man curiously you ain't a goin to take no risks old card i can see that he retorted with a grin i had a mate once who said that to the parson at his wedding and his missus is never quite sure whether she's a respectable woman or ought to be a widder you'll have to get out of that abbot it's as bad as stutterin the taxi driver grinned i knew a cove began bindle what at that moment mr railton rogers omnibus drew up behind the taxi and before it had stopped mr rogers bounced out followed by his entire suite of wife progeny and retainers into the house he dashed and as he recognized his lairs and penance he uttered a howl of triumph the hall was dark and he fell over a chair which brought mr and mrs granger out from the dining-room 
so i've caught you shouted mr rogers triumphantly looking up defiantly at the burly form of mr granger whose good-humoured blue eyes wore a puzzled expression you're a thief a daylight robber but i've caught you mr rogers planted himself on the doorway mr and mrs granger looked at each other in mute wonder will you kindly get out of the way requested mr granger no i won't i've caught you and i mean to keep you said mr rogers making a clutch at mr granger's coat sleeve then something happened and mr rogers found himself sitting in the hall and mr and mrs granger were walking down the path towards their taxi police fetch a policeman don't let them escape yelled mr rogers and the cry was taken up by his family and retainers mr rogers picked himself up and dashed down the path shouting to the drivers of the taxi and the omnibus that if they aided and abetted the criminals to escape their doom was certain has anything happened sir inquired the taxi driver civilly bindle had retired behind a tree in order to avoid being seen he had recognized archie clark he stole my furniture shut up you silly little ass interrupted mr granger then turning to the taxi driver he said perhaps you had better fetch a policeman better fetch a black maria to take all this lot muttered bindle the neighbours were now arriving in strong force and mr rogers cheerfully told his tale to all who would listen but none could make much of what he was saying at the end of a few minutes the taxi returned with a policeman sitting beside the driver as soon as he alighted mr rogers dashed up to him i give this man and woman in charge for stealing my furniture you'd better keep the driver too he's probably an accomplice the policeman turned to mr granger have you anything to say sir i think we had better all go to the police station remarked mr granger coolly there has been a mistake and the wrong furniture has been moved into my house the last bindle saw of the protagonists in this domestic drama of which he was the sole author was the railton rogerses being bundled into their omnibus by mr railton rogers and mr and mrs granger calmly entering their taxi on the front seat of which sat the policeman he turned reluctantly away regretful that he was not to see the last act the epilogue took place on the following monday when early in the morning bindle was called into the manager's office and summarily dismissed returning to fenton street earlier than usual he was greeted by mrs bindle with the old familiar words lost your job yes said bindle as he removed his coat but it was worth it mrs bindle stared End of chapter 17, read by Don W. Jenkins, Rancho San Diego, California, shaggybark.blogspot.com.